Considering the Olympics this week, I reimagined an old, old story originally about an individual's journey as a collective one. Feeling lost, the nations of the world go on a quest to answer the question, who are we? They gather at the base of a mountain where a teacher lives in a cave. A representative chosen by this mass of humanity enters and says to the teacher, we are on a quest to find the answer to the question, who are we? The teacher shakes her head and replies, I'm sorry, I cannot help you with that one. So humanity treks on farther up the mountain. Days later, they reach another cave. One of them enters and finds an old sage hunched over a fire. They sit down and ask, will you please help us answer the question, who are we? The sage smiles, oh, that is not for me to know or to say. The mass departs yet again, going higher up the mountain. After several bewildering days, the people arrive at yet another cave, where they find an old woman sitting at its entrance, alone on a rug. Exasperated, the nations cry together, Who are we? The old woman calmly studies the masses, arches an eyebrow, and smiles as she says, Who's asking? <laughs> These are the questions I imagine swirling at the mouth of the cave of Matthew 25. Who are we might well be the question that occasions Jesus' parable, which in true form answers our own question with its own. Who's asking? In other words, how do you understand and articulate the meaning of this we of which you speak? I was hungry and you fed me, Jesus offers. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was without a home and you gave me room. I was shivering and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you stopped to visit in prison and you remembered me and came to me. What are you talking about? The people respond. Don't the best questions always lead to more questions? When did we ever see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we ever see you on the street and help you, or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And Jesus responds, whenever you did one of these things to anyone, overlooked or ignored, that was me. You did it to me. Maybe what Jesus means here is what Jesus represents and reveals is true of all people. That there is an inherent sacredness sheltered in our bones. A hidden dignity dancing in our DNA. And humanity are living expressions of divinity. To notice and then to tend those overlooked and ignored then, those marginalized and maligned, those in need of food or freedom, is a humanizing corrective where dehumanization has been dealt, or where dignity and divinity have been denied. There is something holy about participating in the healing of humanity and the world. This last parable of Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew is like a mountain summit where every one of his teachings merge and meld together as one. It is a profound pronouncement of the ultimate importance and deeper significance of acts of compassion, generosity, and love. And this is not merely a call to charity. Though charity is vital when people do not have this day their daily bread, as we pray each week. But it also represents a radical reordering of the world where everyone is esteemed and has enough. Jesus invites a mystical way of perceiving life. 
Jesus inspires a unique answer to the question, who are we? Ubuntu, the South African concept of the interconnectedness of community, might be one of the best ways to understand it. Ubuntu is most often translated, I am because we are. I am not fully me until you are fully you, until you have what you need for a viable life of freedom and joy. The Reverend Tracy Blackman, a brilliant colleague of mine I heard speak recently, shared a conversation that she overheard at a church in Seattle between a mother and her young daughter. Mom, why do we always go to church? The daughter asked, to which the mother responded, we go to church to practice love together. Sometimes practicing love is intuitive and easy, and other times it may challenge us to learn something new or to listen to truly understand, to be quiet long enough for the whole truth to be illuminated. Love may invite us to examine our privilege not let it law us into complacency, but to channel it instead, to center new voices and to be a voice for change. Love may require humility and difficult conversations about where harm is being done and changed behavior that will reveal the realness of an apology. If anyone is not safe in the community of the church, a place that should be the safest place in the world, then, in the wisdom of Ubuntu, none of us is truly safe. Church is where we practice love together, practice engaging our collective will to love, that we might emerge renewed in our commitment to then go and build lives and homes and families and communities of love. I am because we are. It is love as solidarity, that long-term commitment to understanding each other and learning how to best love and accompany each other in our beautiful particularities. Or as Barbara Brown Taylor once put it so perfectly, I am not sure it is possible to see the face of God in other people if we cannot see the faces they already have. At some subterranean level of the heart, I heard Rob Bell speak this week. What we all want is for another human to say, I see you. This is one of the great gifts we offer each other. We notice, we acknowledge, we see. That one line, I see you, whether spoken or simply experienced, holds so much. Think of how much violence in our world comes from the hands of those who have never felt seen. When there aren't jobs or education or belonging or options or basics like food and water and health care, and no one seems to care, we get angry. That anger can become political and societal and structural, but it often starts deeply personal. No one sees. The injustice, the oppression, the exploitation, the bullying, the abuse, someone was getting away with it, and those who could stop it didn't see, or they saw and looked away, indifferent. And then, that pain sometimes escalates in concentric circles outward, from a question to a longing to a wounded bitterness to a simmering anger to a bomb to a vote for toxic candidates in a desperate attempt to blow the whole system up. All of it often beginning with that initial aching appeal. Do you see this? Do you see what I'm going through here? Do you see me? Many of us simply need to know we're not alone, to hear our true names called and the name, the truth of our pain for others. 
Who are we? Who's asking? We are the ones who seek to call each thing, each person, by their right name and bear witness to each other's pain. We are the ones who will take a little more care in learning and using someone's preferred pronouns and gently correcting ourselves when we err. In a time when literally hundreds of anti-LGBTQ bills fill state legislative agendas and human beings are mercilessly othered out of ignorance and fear, we have no time for anything but moral courage and advocacy and love. We are the ones who will say the name of Sonia Massey, another black woman executed in her home by one called to serve after making a 911 call for help. Her last words invoking the name of Jesus as if insisting don't you see how the holy resides here too? We are the ones who will continue to insist that black lives are sacred until that truth is reflected in policy and practice. We are the ones who will resist the myth of redemptive violence, refuse to believe it ever truly resolves anything, to condemn the abhorrent violence in Israel on October 7th, and the abhorrent violence in Gaza every day since, and refuse to let these peoples be divided in our hearts and prayers. When literal Nazis are marching in downtown Nashville in the year 2024, threatening and attacking Jewish people, and in a time when the Council on American-Islamic Relations reported over 8,000 hate incidents in America in 2023 alone, we must insist on an end to the violence. Relentlessly remind the world we are not made for this. We are made to live into the prophet's vision that is reflected in Jesus' parable. Do you remember the words? Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they study war anymore. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and turn their spears into pruning hooks. We are the ones who plant and prune gardens filled with herbs and vegetables and fruits that directly reflect the needs of our neighbors and the specificities of their culinary traditions. We are healing the soil on this campus, becoming a sanctuary for pollinators and an educational space for the children of Pilgrim School and just last week for the eighth graders of Ola, our partners just across Sixth Avenue. We are the ones in the spirit of Ubuntu who provide fresh groceries to our neighbors and diapers to young families in our communities, hygiene kits to the unsheltered neighbors, and needed clothing and reusable market bags. We are the ones who build community by emphasizing belonging over belief, much like Jesus' parable seems to do, and meet each other where we are on our sacred sojourning and meaning-making meandering. We are the ones among whom it is safe to doubt, to wrestle with faith, and to tear down old ways and belief systems that no longer work for us, and explore and build new ones. We are the ones organizing every expression of our work among the collaboratives, practicing our, engaging our collective wills, in deepening our spirituality, in finding and growing within community, and mobilizing even more for justice. We are the ones who welcome all to the table and help people know and remember the heart of Jesus' message. You already belong, exactly as you are. All that for which you've longed and grasped, it's already yours. You are good. You are enough. You are loved right now. And oh, how we'll continue singing and playing along in the most extraordinary way, in every facet of this beautiful shared life. 
In all of this, when did we see you, O God? And then we'll remember. Palestinian-American poet Naomi Shihab Nye. The river is famous to the fish. The loud voice is famous to silence, which knew it would inherit the earth before anybody said so. The cat sleeping on the fence is famous to the birds watching him from the birdhouse. The tear is famous, briefly, to the cheek. The idea you carry close to your bosom is famous to your bosom. The boot is famous to the earth, more famous than the dress shoe, which is famous only to floors. The bent photograph is famous to the one who carries it, and not at all famous to the one who is pictured. I want to be famous to shuffling old men who smile while crossing streets, sticky children in grocery lines, famous as the one who smiled back. I want to be famous in the way a pulley is famous, or a buttonhole, not because it did anything spectacular, but because it never forgot what it could do. Who are we? Who's asking? Those among whom the answer keeps unfolding, because we will never forget all we can and will do.